There was no fire that was taken from that mosque. It was shot into because we were angry. The reason I am doing this today is not only for myself and for the rest of society to hear, but it's for all those who can't be here to talk about the things that we went through, talk about the things that we did. With that being said, that is my testimony. I just want to say that I am sorry for the hate and destruction that I have inflicted on innocent people, and I'm sorry for the hate and destruction that others have inflicted on innocent people. At one point, it was okay, but reality has shown that it is not, and that this is happening, and that until people hear about what is going on with this war, it will continue to happen, and people will continue to die. I am sorry for the things that I did. I am no longer the monster that I once was. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sam Lynch. Uh, I went in, uh, came in the Army in 1994 as an infantryman. I did active duty for a little while. And uh, 1997, I became a conscientious objector. But I opted to stay in the military and, and transfer into medical services. Uh, after getting out of active duty, I went to the North Carolina National Guard, and I deployed with the North Carolina National Guard to Iraq from February 2004 until December 2004. So I think what I, I want to, to focus on during my, my time of talking is the medical response to the Iraqi people. Um, throughout the next eight months, there were, out of uh, probably approximate 15 doctors in our clinic, there were three doctors that would go to see the detainees. So it became a situation where the, the medical, the medics did most of the medical care. Uh, and most of the, the things that were seen were headaches and backaches and things that could be treated rather easily with Tylenol or Motrin, but there were uh, uh, urinary tract infections, there were hernias, there were things that really did require a doctor's care. And when I confronted doctors with it, uh, in at least four cases, four different doctors responded that we're not going to see them because they're not American. Some specific instances, we, early on, there was a uh, individual who had blood clots uh, in in his uh, in his lower legs, and it was a, a a fear that a blood clot would loosen itself and become lodged and cause a stroke. So we had him on Lovenox shots to twice a day to cut out the blood clots, uh, and I had to at this time it was right when the the det uh, this operation was starting, so I was still going through and getting doctor's signatures on prescriptions. And depending on who the doctor on duty was, depended on whether or not this, this person would get his medication or not. Uh, towards the end of the rotation, it got to the point where the medical personnel were writing the prescription. Not the, not the doctors, but the medics themselves were prescribing medicine for the detainees because nobody else would do it. Um, going into the detainee center, when we did a initial assessment of, of all the detainees, there was a, a tendency for the MPs who ran the detainee center to want to identify the detainees by what they were being arrested for. And so instead of it being an, an individual, they lost their name, they became a number, and it became 30-0024, for example, try to bomb U.S. soldiers, or is targeting uh, uh, translators. Really, they lost their identity in that process, and it was really hard to maintain a unbiased attitude towards caring for them when the first thing you hear about them is what they're there for. But as it turns out, there was a high percentage of the 
people who were detained that were just released because there was not enough evidence on. And I don't have an exact number, but during the time that I was supervisor, we saw approximately 225 detainees, and I would say that at least 60 or 70 percent never, never had enough evidence on. Um, the, this medical neglect actually started to, to transcribe out into the other elements of, of Iraqi people, the Iraqi workers on the post. We, uh, they would be doing construction work and have an injury and they would be refused treatment. The translators, there was a translator who I worked with quite often who uh, developed a hip problem and tried to get him an x-ray and, and the doctors refused treatment on him. Um, there was just a, a lot of a lot of neglect, and it, it it's a situation that I felt at the time that I should have said something, and I didn't. And being in charge, I I feel a lot of guilt because I I didn't say anything at the time, and I, I really feel that I did an injustice to these people by not not demanding that that the doctors actually see them and and instead trying to to do the doctor's job me and the other medics on our own and i believe that's all i have good morning my name is Mike Ta, and I served with the 716th MP Battalion in the 101st Airborne. I um, was deployed to Iraq in April of two oh, 2003 and returned home in April of 2004. At one point in the deployment, when I was on a convoy just north of Baghdad, we pulled over to have an MRE refuel our trucks. And it was about a, a six-vehicle convoy. Oftentimes, the kids in the surrounding community would run up to us and... and say thank you, thank you, and, and, and be very uh, welcome, welcome us with warm arms. Um, and we didn't want that kind of attention from the kids for fear of their safety because we, were, we knew we were a targeted audience in that country. And this one incident, a kid was trying to cross a four-lane median highway and was struck by a vehicle going about 65. We, a number of us ran over there. I hopped in my truck and ran to, to stop traffic. A number of us, including my sergeant major, ran over there. And by the time he was walking back to his truck, which was about 30 seconds after he looked at the kid, said, he's gone, move out. And I wondered to myself, what would have happened if this was an American kid who was just struck? Um, Pre-deployment, the cultural competency training that we received can be best summed up in a sentence. Don't touch the people of Iraq's left hand. They wipe their ass with it. And that's what we got. The um, Iraqi policemen, we were, okay, our mission was um, in part to run a jail in Karbala, not for enemy prisoners of war, but just for the general population prison. These prisoners we brought into the, by the Iraqi police and and then we were to show them through the processing um, and how we do things in America. <laughs> we weren't in charge necessarily of enemy prisoners of war, but on, on the night of October 17th in 2003, six people were brought in by the Iraqi police who claimed that these six were participants in the actions the night prior. Therefore, they were enemy prisoners of war due to coalition standards. When these people were brought in, they were appeared to be beaten already badly. They were lined up on the concrete wall and they interlaced, they were, we were told, we told them to interlace their fingers, which is a form of control because you can grab your middle finger and your index finger and squeeze them together and it's quite painful. Interlace their fingers, place their foreheads on the concrete wall, cross your ankles and put your hands on top of your head so we can search you and process you in. They were tagged, they were searched, and they were also beaten. Not just by Americans, 
but by Bulgarian soldiers and by Polish soldiers, by Iraqi policemen, and by me. I grabbed the man by the jaw and I looked him in the eye and I, I slammed his head up against the wall and I looked him again in the eye and said, you must have been the one that killed Grilly. And then I, he fell, I kicked him. An Iraqi policeman, probably the size of the biggest security man here, with hands to match the size of a Kodiak, hit a guy in the side of the head about six times and I thought to myself, I'm, think, I'm looking at him and I laughed, I'm like, yeah, these, these guys are getting what they deserve. I never found out whether or not this all took place also in, in, in the presence of a, of a lieutenant, my lieutenant, within earshot of, of many NCOs. I never found out what happened to these, these people, these six prisoners. I don't know whether they, where they went. I don't know anything about that. Um, and I'm up here today to speak on behalf of all the people who haven't returned home, who can't speak. This isn't just some isolated incident. This happened in the presence of NCOs, commissioned officers, and coalition forces, not only as participants, but also as witnesses. My being up here displays my anger, both by, on multiple levels, by the Americans' behavior overseas, by our president's continuous rhetoric about Iraq being a success, about this country's citizens and apathy to this occupation. And this is why I'm here today as well. These events happen in our name and each and every single one of you are responsible for this as well. I am very sorry for my actions and I can't take back what I did. I ask the forgiveness of the people of Iraq and of my country and I will not enable this any further. General Petraeus, you may not remember me, but you once led me. You're no longer a leader of men. You've exploited your troops for your own gain and have become just another cheerleader for this occupation policy. So you pinned this on me in Babylon in 2003 following the October 16th incident. I will no longer be a puppet for your personal gain and for your political career. Thank you. طبعا اليوم داحتي اتاحت لي الفرصة على مود احكي لكم الوضع الصار بيا من بغداد والوضع حال الامني وش صار بيا يعني وشون تأثرت يعني مواضيع يعني بيوم من الأيام كنت بالمدرسة طبعا دوامنا صبحي فكنا دا ندرس ها فعلى غفلة طبوا الأمريكان طبعا وطلعونا طلعونا برا فقالوا يعني على أساس أكو أسلحة أو إرهابية يعني بالمدرسة ها فطلعونا برا وقعدوا يدورون وي بعثروا المدرسة وطلعونا برا ويعني إحنا طبعا أطفال كنا ونخاف من هيك مواضيع يعني وأسلحة وهيك وأذرعة وهاي يعني فكنا كلش خايفين وآني طبعا بالخامس وياي أختي كانت فكلش خفت يعني صارت عندي حالة يعني من كل شيء أخاف من كل شيء يصير أخاف طبعا آني طموحة وكل الزينة بالدراسة طبعا تردد دائما أكون يعني أحسن يعني فرد صالح من المجتمع طبعا وأحقق على الأقل حلم واحد يعني من أحلامي اللي أنا دا أفكر بيها وأحقق أحلام الكل طفل عراقي اللي شاف مثل مأساة اللي شفتها طبعا واللي شافوها زميلاتي بالمدرسة وتأثروا بيها طبعا امي شافت هيك وضع وابويا شاف هيك وضع خلوني اقعد عن المدرسه وما اداوم فيعني هذا كلش اجعز يعني ضجت كلش من هذا الوضع 
ف طبعا اضطروا لانه الوضع الامني كان ابد مو زين الامان ماكو على غفله يفوتون الامريكان على غفله ميليشيا تفوت علينا يعني نحن ما ما نريد حياتنا احنا ها فامي قالت نقعدهم طبعا ضاع علي ضاعت علي يعني دراستي ويعني دائما كنت طموحه واريد اتقدم واحلامي احققها بس مع الاسف ما خلوني امارس يعني احلمي واحققها من من سبب هاي الوضع الامني ببغداد والقتل والعنف والارهاب وكل شيء مسيطرين علينا كل شيء ما نقدر ناخذ راي يعني ياخذون راينا طبعا اتمنى لكل عراقي يعني ويعني كعمري انا همينه عراقيه وكل قد عمري واكبر واكبر كل العراقيين يحققون احلامهم طبعا ويروح العنف وي Hi, good morning. Um, thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Kentu and Jen Hogg, without whom I would not be on this panel. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I trained as a combat medic. I joined straight out of high school. I was 17. Um, my first experience with sexual harassment was with my recruiter. He was married and his wife was pregnant. And um, he used to make it a requirement for me to like, go with him and like talk to other soldiers about joining the army and da -da -da, kind of like really them in, you know? Um, and so like that was one thing. And then one night he got drunk and he had to stay at a hotel because his wife was mad at him or something. And he had me drive him to the hotel. And at the hotel, um, 